Yeah, welcome everybody to the National Colloquium on Artificial Intelligence. My name is Raul Rojas, um, calling from Germany. And today we have Jeff Sutcliffe, who is a very well-known professor of computer and science from the University of Miami. Jeff has lived in many countries. So he was actually born in what's now Zambia, then he went to New Zealand, then he got his bachelor's degree in South Africa. Um, and also his master's, and then he went uh, to do a PhD in Australia. And uh, he, he, he has been working on automated reasoning for many years and at the University of Miami for the last uh, 20 years. And uh, he's the, the person behind a very successful system for uh, testing theorem provers. So nowadays, if you want to to to, to to develop a theorem, a theorem prover and see how well it performs against uh, other theorem provers, you don't have to, to guess. You can go to the, to the website and the system that he has developed, and then you can launch your uh, theorem prover and test it against thousands of problems. So, and that's uh, the meaning of this TP, TP acronym, th thousands of problems for theorem provers. And today, uh, Jeff is going to talk about um, the idea behind the concept of having a test bed for theorem provers, how this came to be, and also everything that you have to consider when uh, you are developing a system like this. So we are very honored to have you here today, Jeff, and uh, you have the floor. Great. Thanks, Raul, and thanks for inviting me. I'm always happy to talk about my baby, the TPTP world. I've been building this project since 1992, so you can imagine if you've got children who were born around then. That's how long I've been working on this one project, the TPTP world. As Raoul said, this started and is still a mechanism, a framework for evaluating automated theorem proving, automated reasoning systems and classical logics. But its tentacles, like an octopus, have spread. And so I'm going to talk about not only the core work, but also the tentacles and the other implications. Uh, I understand that out there in YouTube land, there are people from various disciplines in computer science and artificial intelligence. And so we'll begin by talking a little bit about the background of what is automated theorem proving or automated reasoning, and then move into some of the more, some of the details. As you can see from my table of contents, I've got a lot of things I can talk about. So I'm going to talk about each thing only briefly. So the good news is, if you want more information, I've got plenty more I can give you. The other piece of good news is, if you don't like one section, just wait for two or three minutes and I'll move on to another section that might interest you more. So the first thing you should do, if you're ever on your web browser, is make this your home page, which is the home page of the TPTP World Project. And all of the resources that I'm going to discuss today are available from there. If you can't find something, just email me and I'll make it all available. So let's start off here. <clears throat> There's my little logo, the TPTP world. What is automated theorem proving? So you can read the words or look at the picture. The picture shows the general idea that I was trying to address. The world has problems. And really what we'd like to do is get a solution in the world. Of course, for many world problems, this is not possible. And so one possible technique is to convert the world problem into a logic problem, use an automated reasoning system, an automated theorem prover to solve the logic problem, which gives you a logic solution, which you then convert back to a world solution. And that all sounds very grand, but not always possible. But let's talk about it as a principle. So you can see here that we have the world, which we'll write down in code in some logic as a set of axioms, just some formal description of the world, and a problem that we want to solve, which we'll then encode as a conjecture in logic, give those together to an automated reasoning system. Hopefully, we get a proof, and from that proof, we can convert it to a world solution. So the tools we're going to use are these automated reasoning tools or automated theorem provers. How do they work? Well, in general, this is the idea. 
you have a set of axioms that describe the entire world and some conjecture, some problem you want to solve, you want to show logical consequence. We hand it over to your theorem prover, whichever one you love, and one of three things happens. If it says yes and gives you a proof, then you're really happy, you've got a solution. It might say no. In fact, it can assure you that there is no solution, which is also useful information. And sadly, due to the complexity of this problem as an AI problem, quite often, if you've given it five minutes, at five minutes, it still hasn't been able to do anything and you get a timeout. One of the most common approaches to doing those proofs is a proof by refutation, where you take the axioms and the negation of the conjecture, hand it over to your automated reasoning system, which then tries to determine that this set is unsatisfiable or contains a contradiction, which gives you a proof by refutation of C from the axioms. Or it might say no, because it's found a model that these are consistent, the axioms negate a conjecture, or it times out. Of course, one of the weaknesses of this approach in a classical logic setting is that if your axioms are contradictory themselves, then you can prove anything. And uh, this is really the case in large axiomatic systems that try to encode large complicated things that those axioms do turn out to be contradictory. For those of you in formal math who've used the whole four library, just last year we found a contradiction in the whole four library, which no one would ever have expected because it's such a well-developed and mature system. So to solve that, one of the flip sides of the coins in the automated theorem proving community is to just give your axioms to a model finding automated reasoning system and hope that it can find a model so you know your axioms are consistent. If it says no, your axioms are inconsistent and it's time to get back to the drawing board and you know, work out what went wrong, or sadly, again, it might time out. Of course, in anything other than propositional level, this is a, problem, this is a semi decidable problem and so timeout happens because it's just too hard. And so that's the loop. So what sort of things do we apply these to? Well, here's a motivating example that happened recently, some work I did for a company in Venezuela. It's a car company, an experimental car company called the Sucre, which I understand means sugar. And this was the Kipos car they were building that worked on, it was mainly an electric car with a lot of electronic components that were driving it, a circuit for controlling the battery, a circuit for controlling the drive system on the wheels, and some circuitry for controlling the human haptics because your steering wheel had feedback, haptic feedback on it. And um, they were having problems with this, is that there was, you know, uh, the system wasn't working. This is a simplification I'm giving you a little bit. And what was happening is that the car's self-steering and automatic braking features we're going on and off in the, in, incorrectly. And so we encoded this problem and we got a bunch of things and these represent the problem, the axioms of the world. This is a problem, these would be the axioms. We encoded all this in first order logic. And then we asked the problem is which circuit, the question we asked it to a theorem prover is which circuit is causing the failures. And it turned out that the wheel control circuit had a loop back on itself and it was causing itself to fail. So that's a sort of a practical example that I've worked on. All right, so this continues on with what I've just said. So what do you use these for in the broad world? Well, I know there are people from CMAT here and they'll be aware the use of automated theorem proving in math mathematics, the Robbins problem to show that every Robbins algebra is a Boolean algebra originally posed by Tarski was solved at Argon Labs by the theorem prover EQP. In work in geometry, there's very advanced work going on now in abelian inner mapping groups. For people who've used the Mizar library, that's all been verified using theorem provers, work with Joseph Urban I did. And if any of you use Mathematica, inside Mathematica, there is now embedded the equational theorem prover Voltmeister, which came from Max Planck Institute in Saarbrück in Germany. And the guy who wrote that is now rich. The current hot business using theorem provers is to do verification of software and verification of hardware. Microsoft, Intel, 
Google, anybody you speak to who makes chips or writes software, uses automated theorem-proving technology to verify properties of their software. For example, you want to verify that it is never possible to divide by zero, or you'll never have an array index out of bounds. Um, that's hot business and making money. Amazon has a huge group in software verification, and they're always hiring if you know anything about this stuff. Reasoning about processes is an interesting thing, particularly security protocols and security, again, work at Amazon. And this also works when you're modeling factories and things like that. There's stuff trying to reason about the whole broad world that we know and love. Um, an example of this that I've worked on is the SUMO, Suggested Upper Merged Ontology, which tries to capture things like weather, weapons of mass destruction, transport systems, chemistry. And of course, because it captures so much, it is one of the ones where the axioms turn out to be contradictory quite often. And that's something we've been working on. People might have seen the TV show when the IBM Watson system won the game Jeopardy against the Jeopardy champion, another success in knowledge-based systems. And then there's things out in the real world. The people at SRI encoded the high school biology textbook. People in Luxembourg are looking at legal reasoning, particularly the GDPR laws of Europe. Uh, Carsten Schurman in Denmark has done work in verifying voting protocols, for example, to show that no box full of ballots is in the com in, only has one person watching it at a time. And for those with an interest in philosophical aspects of religion, Chris Bensmull is proof of the existence of God based on Gödel's proof. The ontological argument is another social application. Well, <clears throat> to do this, you need one of those tools, automated theorem provers. Some of these names might be familiar. The picture on the right shows you really what it's like. These are complicated pieces of software in almost all cases with lots of components and lots of computer science. If you haven't done your undergraduate courses in data structures and complexity analysis, you aren't going to do too well writing a theorem prover. Classic cases up here, Otter from Argon Labs, one of the very early ones, and its successor, Prover 9. Current success stories are E, Spass, and Vampire, which are doing very well. And Vampire is well known for winning the competition that Raul mentioned at the start, something I run every summer, a competition for automated theorem proving systems. I might have time to talk about that a bit later. I'm not going to go through the details here. There are different styles of systems. Recently, there's been an uh, increased interest on systems with arithmetic capabilities because these are needed for verifying hardware and software. One of the top ones of CVC4, which is about to be upgraded to CVC5 which is uh, from Andy Reynolds, and Z3 from Microsoft Research. Very, very important. These often work in the SMT world, which is the competitor to my TPT world. There's SMT and TPTP. Higher order logic, very useful for doing more subtle things. If you're interested in modal logics and non-classical logic, you can get help up there, and also set theory for mathematicians. Um, Raul just pointed out to me, and I just fixed this slide, people are interested in the history, you can follow the Theorem Prover Museum. You don't have to take note of anything here. This talk is available online, of course, and you can follow it at my URL. So, what is the TPTP world before we delve in? What's my infrastructure? It's just a lot of things. The first part of it was the library of test problems for Theorem Provers. The SZS ontology for how theorem provers should present their results. The TSTP solution library, lots of solutions for people to look at, and the competitions. And I just have to show this. I wrote a paper about this way back in the 90s. And this was the review. And I think this is the most fantastic review of a paper I've ever had. And I'll read it out with you. The reviewer, like most readers of the AI journal, believes the style of systems compared here in the TPTP competition, whose intellectual roots are still in the 70s and early 80s, are misguided. He said, I am intellectually frozen 
in a time warp of the early days and kept only alive by a small, isolated and dedicated community is a famous judgment. So hence, the competitions are not only a waste of time, but they are counterproductive as they lure the young researcher into a style of work that is essentially wasted. And the organizers should be forced to drink the poisoned cup of Socrates for corrupting the youth. And I thought that was a great review. In fact, that reviewer did accept the paper, but I thought he made his point. All right, so let's start delving into some of the details of the TPTP world. And the core of this is the problem library that Raul mentioned in his kind introduction. This started in 1992 with Christian Suttner from the Technical University of Munich, when people were writing theorem provers and not evaluating them well. Some people would choose 10 problems that they knew they could solve, show they could solve them, and publish it. And that's cheating. We all know that. You've got to do fair testing. The flip side of the story we observed is that people were having great ideas, testing them on the wrong 10 problems, and giving up on their great idea. So we started collecting problems for theorem provers. By the way, you've got to watch the pictures. There's jokes all the time. Okay, so this is the TPTP. So here was our aim, was to get a centralized and maintained set of problems for evaluating automated theorem proving programs. So that results would be statistically significant, repeatable, and led to meaningful evaluations. You can see here, the first release was in 1993. Yes, this is my baby. It's uh, 28 years old, is that right? Am I doing my math? Yeah, 28 years old. It's already graduated and done graduate studies. At the moment, we're at TPTP 7.4.0, which has 23,000 problems over a range of topics. We can look at some of the topics. There's topics in logic, a large number of topics in mathematics, set theory, algebras, number theory, topology, category theory. There are topics in computer science, from the theory of computer science going through areas of artificial intelligence up to the verification areas. There's topics in science and engineering, biology, medicine, processes, products, social science, social choice theory, management, geography, in the philosophy, and then we've got some others, puzzles, miscellaneous, things like that. So it's a very nice, broad uh, collection of problems. The problems come in three layers of logic. There's first-order logic, classical first-order logic, typed first-order logic, which might be, which is made up of the monomorphic and the polymorphic, and typed higher-order logic, that's Church's simple type theory, again, a monomorphic and a polymorphic variant. One of the key features is that these problems are easy to read, both from a human perspective and from a computing perspective. Writing a parser for this is trivial. In fact, if you're a prologue programmer, parsing this is a matter of read X, and you can read stuff. So let's have a look at an example. Here's what one of the problems looks like. Everything up here in the header with the leading percent sign is a comment, and so it's not available to the automated theorem proving program, it's for the human user to read, which it documents the problem, tells you what it is, a little description, provides references to papers or emails where, where I found it, its status, yes, this one is a theorem. One of the interesting things that I'll talk about later is the rating that tells you how difficult the problem is with respect to the state of the art, the current state of the art today with theorem proving. So this, is, I think it's gone down, but when I put this slide together, this had a rating of 0 0.93, which means really hard. Zero means really easy. If you can't solve this, you should go and do it something else. One means nobody can solve it. So 0 0.93 means it's a real toughie. Some syntactic measures and SPCs that say what's this nature of this problem. So this is a first order problem. That's a theorem. It's really first order. It can't be reduced to propositional and it contains some equality. You'll see why these SPCs are helpful later. You can do include. So here I've included the axioms of set theory and the axioms of ordinal numbers that come from a suite of axiomatizations that are maintained. Then each formula, here's an axiom, 
It has a name, it's an axiom, it says for all A, B, C. Notice that I use exclamation mark for for all instead of an upside down A. It says if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C, then A is a subset of C. Easy stuff. And there's the conjecture. So as you can see, this is all quite readable by a human. And in particular, every character is on your keyboard. You don't need to do control alt meta if you're an Isabel user. You can type it all using a good old ASCII keyboard. And it's very easy to read for people and for a machine parser. So I would say one of the keys to the success of the TPTP is the TPTP language. We have a very nice language and written in BNF with an extended back is now a form syntax. I don't want to go into the details like, like this, but just to say is that that's how you write stuff in TPTP. This is how you write it in XML. And so don't use XML. XML is bad for you. Uh, if you're interested in the details of the language, you can find the entire BNF online with all hyperlinked ready to go. Um, the entire TPTP library is available as a tarball. There's a link there, or just go to your home page, which is now that, and you'll find it available online and free. And next year, I'm now, well, right now, I'm working on porting everything into GitHub, so it'll be available from GitHub very soon. All right, so what else should we talk about? How are we going for time here? Half an hour. Um, yeah, so let's talk about the SZS ontology. What is this? One of the things that I observed after about three or four years of working in this project is that many theorem proving programs would print, would give it the problem to solve, and it would print yes. Oh boy, that's not very good. Or it would print nothing, it wouldn't print a proof. So I realized it was necessary to provide formal ways for theorem proving programs to say what they had established about the problem they were trying to solve. So we wanted to correctly and pre precisely specify what is known or established, and it's a standard way. What this did is avoided misinterpretation. As we know, automated theorem proving programs often embedded in a more complex reasoning environment. This is just one little tool that you can call on. Isabel calls on theorem provers for the math people. All sorts of things call on theorem provers. And so the language interface has to be clearly defined. And that's what we provide here. And so we have three ontologies. One to say, oops, it is easy. Double shot there. The success ontology. Sorry, I'm going back to this slide again. There it is that tells you what kind of success. I mean, the most common one would be this in the middle where I'm moving my cursor. You, you proved it's a theorem, but there's a lot more possibilities based on semantics. Another thing, and as Alan Bundy put it in, I think, chapter 10 of his book on the mathematical basis for reasoning, whatever it's called, great book, is that if things, if your theorem prover fails, it times out, that also provides useful information. And so there's a no success ontology, which allows a theorem proven program to say why it failed to produce a result. And finally, we also have a data form ontology, which enables you to express what kind of output you've got. Is it a proof? Is it a refutation? Is it a model? Is it a finite model? Things like that. And there are standards for reporting that output in a way that will easy to be picked up in the standard output of a theorem proving programs. And it's easy because you look for these three letters, SZS. And why is it called the SZS ontology? For those of you who use Unix as an operating system and the programming language AWK, A -W -K, you might know that that programming is language is named after its inventors, A.O. Weingart and Koenigen. I think we'll find it. Well, SZS stands for Sutcliffe, Zimmer, and Schultz. That's me and two colleagues who did this work. It's all available online from there. All right. So after I built all, got all these problems together with Christian, we started to think, what should we do next? And we said, huh, well, if we've got all the problems, let's try and get all the solutions. And so we took the entire TPTP library, 
found every theorem prover we could get on from our friends. And back in those days, we were getting magnetic tapes, reel-to-reel -reel tapes, and internet was kind of funky back then. And we put them all together and found some computers. I was using the lab, the student lab, and we ran every theorem prover on every problem, and we produced the TSTP solution library. So this was a reference mechanism where we could see the output from in standard format from ADP systems. So I'd convert everything into my language, the TPTP language. And the main use is it allows the other people to see how a particular theorem is proved. If you're developing a theorem prover and you think, how the heck did they solve that? You can go and look here and see how more advanced tools have managed, and that'll help you with your development. Another thing we can do is that it helps us find bugs in theorem provers because we can now compare the results. I have currently 67 theorem proving programs, I think, available, run over all 23,000 problems. I have a large cluster for this, of course. And if anybody reports something quite different to others, I email and say, hey, Joe, your theorem prover has got something wrong here, and it helps with debugging. So when we do this, how are we going to time? Six, um, what do we do? We run them on my cluster and we give them a time limit. And you might say, well, if a theorem prover doesn't solve a problem in five minutes, why not give it 10 minutes or 20 minutes? And it turns out that's unnecessary. We did analysis. And this is some data. It's a couple of years old, I can see now. But it shows if here's the CPU time, let's take the bottom line here. And this is the number of problems solved. So purple is vampire. He solves five and a half thousand problems here. And it shows that for a lot of problems, the first four and a half thousand are done in 10 seconds. The first 4,000 in about one second. And then very quickly, the wheels fall off. So that's with a 300 second limit. You can imagine if I gave it a 600 second limit, it wouldn't do a lot more because this the curve is going vertical. This is super exponential. We've measured it, and I can explain some details. So I've found that 300 seconds is always enough. Nobody, every theorem prover is doing everything it can. The outputs, as I've mentioned, are in the TPTP language. This file looks similar to a problem file. Information about the problem, information about the hardware and resources, information about the result, some statistics about the result, and you can see the proof is written in exactly the same language as the problem. Ping, this should ring a bell. Proofs and problems are written in the same language. So for those of you who like pipelining software together, you can put a theorem prover, pipe, send its output, standard output directly in to another tool because the two languages are the same for problems and solutions. All of this is available online, of course. Um, Right, let's talk about this one as well. So one of the things I mentioned is that for every problem in the TPTP, let's go back to that slide, here we see it has a rating of how difficult it is. And you can see how the rating varies over time, going up and down, and typically going down. In this case, it's a strange one, because it seems to stay about the same. It's the difficulty with respect to the state of the art. And of course, the state of the art changes over time. So how do you measure the difficulty of a problem? So here's how we do it. And this works for many, many um, situations. So if you think of this yellow box as all the problems in the TPTP, and some of the problems in the TPT represented by the colored dots, the ones that are not black, those dots are problems that are somehow biased. The person who wrote the problem said, I want to design a problem that will really trip up my opposition or something. And so we don't use those problems for anything we do. We get rid of them. Then problems in the TPTP have different characteristics. You saw earlier, again, I'll pop back to here. This problem in set theory is a first order theorem which is really first order, not propositional, is some equality. And so if you want to compare apples with apples and oranges with oranges, you have to put problems of the same type together. So we divide up the TPTP into these specialist problem classes. So each one of these little boxes is now a class. 
So what we'll do now is zoom in to the one specialist problem class, the one in the dark yellow. Well, I've run lots of theorem provers over all the problems. I did that. That's the TFTP, the solution library. And so you can think. So in this example, I've got one, two, three, four, five theorem provers. And these sets show which problems they solve. And so there are some problems out in the yellow area that nobody solved. And there are some problems in the middle, the brown area that most people have solved. And there are some theorem provers, the orange guy and the purple guy, who solves a strict subset of somebody else. Well, if you solve a strict subset of somebody else, you're not very interesting. And so we get rid of them. They go away. And by getting rid of them, we now have the union of these three system solution sets is everything that can be solved by every theorem prover that I know about, and I promise you, I know about all of them. So once you've done that, what we know is the brown problems are really easy because everybody solves them. The yellow problems are really hard. Nobody solves them. That might ring a bell from earlier. Brown is zero. Everybody solves them. Yellow is one. Nobody solves them. And the rest, you just take a fraction. So here we go. You see the fraction that fail. Nobody fails. Everybody fails. A third of them fail. Two thirds of them fail, etc. So that enables us to give a difficulty rating for the problems. And once you've got a difficulty rating for the problems, aha, uh -huh, you can also give a difficulty rating for the uh, not a performance rating for the systems. You can say how good are the systems. So we ignore the very easy problems, ignore the very hard problems, and look at what fraction of them are solved. So you can see here the green system has got a rating of 0 0.55. One of the things we know over time is that we're getting evidence of progress in this research field. Is Here it is. This is data up to 2016. Sorry, this is very out of date. But you can see the ratings go down on average, indicating that the state of the art in automated theorem proving is making progress. And this is useful data when you're asking for funding from a government agency. All of this is available online if you want to. All right. I'm going to skip the TPI. Let's talk about TPTP World Services. So as I mentioned in my introduction, in addition to the data components of the TPTP world, there's a lot of other tentacles that reach out. And one of the nice tentacles that reach out is built on top of the fact that I have every theorem prover in the world. And believe me, I've got them all, pretty much. I've got them all installed on my host. And so I make them all available with a server that I have here in Miami. And that this is available to you for free to use if you want to. That allows you to play with problems. I've got some slides about this, but maybe the best thing to do would be for me to demonstrate the kinds of things you can do. So I'm going to kick up another page. So this is the system on TPTP interface. This is a web interface that sits on top of a server here in Miami that allows you to run automated fear improving programs on problems from the TPTP or problems of your own if you want to and examine the results and see what happens. It's all free. You're welcome to use it as much as you want. The more you use it, the more I ask for money from the National Science Foundation to give me a bigger server. So use it, please, use it. So let's see the kind of things that we do. So here I'm going to take a problem that's in the TPTP. Let's have a look at this problem. It's puzz, what's my favorite demonstration problem? Puzz zero, it's a puzzle problem which came from a, uh, originally, it's a, maybe from Raymond Smulian or someone like that. But it's the story of the three people who live in the mansion, Aunt Agatha, the butler, and Charles. And some rules, some axioms, that a killer hates the victim. Killer is never richer than the victim. Charles hates no one that Ag Agatha hates. Agatha hates everyone except the butler. The butler hates everyone not richer than Agatha. The butler hates everyone Agatha hates. No one hates everyone. Agatha is not the butler. 
And the conclusion is, therefore, Agatha killed herself. So that's a standard sort of problem. Here's some of the axioms. Here's an example axiom. For all x and y, if x killed y, that implies x hates y. All right, simple first order logic that everyone's done as an undergrad. And here's the problem. And it turns out the conjecture is Agatha killed herself. So now, for the people who've been paying attention out there, does this ring any bells? You might remember my little story about the Venezuelan car company, the Sucre, and its control modules. Well, that was just a rewording of this problem. I was not telling a complete truth. I've never worked for a Venezuelan car company. The Sucre is named after a lady friend of mine, Maricela Sucre, who comes from Venezuela. Anyway, let's go back now. So I'm going to try to solve that problem. 0, 0, 1 plus 1. If you want to put your own problem, you can put it here, or you can do a local file or a URL. And we'll give it to hidden theorem provers that I have installed. I told you, I've got lots of them. All of these are installed and available. And I have the latest versions all installed here. This is ongoing work. So let's choose E. This is from Stefan Schultz in Stuttgart, Germany. It's one of the very reliable and TPTP compliant systems. I click the Run button. And it finds the proof straight away. And here's the proof. And you might say, I can't read that proof. But you might see at the end, it's a proof by contradiction. It ends with false. But you're right. You can't read that. It's disgusting. So if you want to, you can pretty it, print it. Here we go. And it comes out nicely formatted. Of course, I've got pretty printers. And that might make it readable to you, or at least to a student of logic. Or I can offer you more. You can go to the IDV, which is an interactive derivation viewer. Now run it. Hello, click. There we go. Coming up. Loading. Bum, bum, bum. Here we come. And what it will show you is the proof tree. So there we see at the top, there's the conjecture and the axioms. If you want to see about them, you can open up some information. So here you see the conjecture over there. I um, highlighted it, and it shows over here that Agatha killed Agatha. There's all the axioms from the problem. Not all of them were used. And you can see the steps of inference. In order to get to number C39, you did an inference from 32 and 33 to get 39. To get to number 42, you took 39 and 27. And these inference rules are done using different inference rules within the E theorem prover. Now, some of these proofs get really big. I'm serious. It's tens and thousands of nodes. And so you can't really look at them comfortably on the screen. So using some students, we did a little bit of work. And we can compute how interesting each node is. Hello, how interesting is each node? And so now here we see a redrawing of that tree where the size of the node indicates how interesting we think the node is. So, for example, here's a pretty big node, number 34. If you look at it, it says, if Charles killed, if Charles killed X, then X is the butler. So the only person Charles would kill is the butler. That's that conclusion. Here's a very interesting one. Roughly, it says over here is that the killer is Agatha. Agatha killed herself. So what you can do then is slide along here and blacken out the boring parts of the proof. Let's say I do that. Uh, remove them. And now we get a proof synopsis. And so with only big steps. So for the mathematicians out there, you might think of these as being the lemmas in the proof. They are steps that are of interest and might be noted with a number in the margin. And we can see the interesting steps. And you can play the same game. So this is really quite a useful tool to look at proofs. The work that's being done at the University of New Mexico in the abelian loops is very reliant on this tool because their proofs are very long and very complicated and they need to summarize them. So that's all about this. That's the system on TP. We have some other tools available for you to use if you want for uh, doing pro problem preparation and other tools for doing solution analysis, including solution verification. 
Again, lots of details that I don't have time to go into. And so I've mentioned some of these things already. So let's now move on to talk about some applications. I think is there anything useful here? Well, let's just talk about how we decided that a node in a proof is interesting. Well, that's kind of good because that's a question I'm often asked. How do you decide that something is interesting? And so we have these measures of obviousness, which is how big is the proof tree down to that node, the weight, how complex the logic formula is that expresses that node, the complexity of that formula, how many different symbols it uses, surprisingness, which tells you suddenly you find two symbols together in a formula that you've never seen together before. Wow, that's kind of interesting. There's some intensity that's based on information theory, adaptivity to do with universal quantification, and focus, which is a polarity issue. And so we do these. We have some loops that run through all of this in order to measure these and combine them as a weighted sum to give you an interestingness. And one here's the little story. When I first ran this, I ran some very simple examples and gave it to my undergraduate artificial intelligence students. And I gave them a list of 10 things that had been proved by a theorem prover and asked them, which ones do you think are interesting? And I wanted to compare what the students thought compared to the eventual weighted sum that I had from this tool that we had written. And it turns out, that students are astonished. If you tell a student A implies B, and I know A, therefore B, they go, whoa, B, I never expected that. So humans doing one step of modus ponens tend to be kind of excited. So we had to uh, sort of rejig the tool a bit. Then I tested it on faculty from the math department who are two floors up from me, and we got some pretty uh, satisfying results there. All right, All right, some applications. So what things have I worked on with people using this TPTP framework? I worked with people at NASA Ames verifying software, automated generating software that was used for controlling the Hubble Space Telescope. And we verified that software in an automated system. And as my friend Bernd Fisher there said, the main thing to do is have lots of fat printouts of paper to give to the FAA so that they feel that you've done something. But that was an interesting project. Um, the Mizar Library, again, math community might be aware of this, originally from Poland, also supported in Canada, which is a formal library of mathematical theorems. And Joseph Urban converted it all to the TPTP language. And we went through and started verifying all of the proofs in the Mizar library. These numbers are a little old now. I know Joseph has got down, got this number up to the 70s now of the number of theorems verified. So that's good, verifying formal mathematics for the people interested in Mizar. Uh, the sledgehammer, for those of you who use Isabel, everybody knows about the sledgehammer tool in Isabel, which allows subproofs in Isabel to be translated into my languages, and then it makes a call to the system on TPTP, that online environment. I showed you the web interface. Of course, you can call it programmatically. And so I sit and watch ticking away. People are using Isabel around the world, call my automated theorem provers in order to do subproofs within the interactive theorem prover Isabel which those proofs are then fed back in my standard language and then reconstructed using the Metis automated theorem prover that's built into Isabel. All right, so that's been a useful application of theorem provers. I've mentioned this one before, the ontological argument. This is work of Chris Benzmuller, the proof of the existence of God, which was highly presented in the German newspapers, including Der Spiegel, and the original... There's various various forms of this, and the one that I that we used the TPTP first was from Benzmuller and Bruno, who did a second order modal proof on the Girdle argument. And what was interesting about that is that uh, who is the gentleman Zohar Manor at uh, Stanford, I think it was, wrote took the typewrite 
typewritten, handwritten version from Gödel and type, put it up in a typewriter. And then Ben Smuller and Bruno, these guys, typed it in and found mistakes in the proof using theorem provers and then discharged it using that online system that I've shown to you. The fun thing about the newspaper article, if this is still available, let me see if it is, that described it, mm, nope, it doesn't come up anymore, it's too old, is that they said that the proof of the existence of God had been done by an Apple laptop, nothing to do with the hard work and logic and artificial intelligence, but a fun, a fun thing to work on. The one last thing I think I'll talk about and then stop and take questions is the automated theorem proving system competition that I run every year. It'll be on the 13th of July this year and people all enter it. How did this all begin to have a competition? Well, look at the date. This happened, We thought about this in 1994 when we had built the TPTP problem library, just the core of everything that we were working on, myself and Christian. Here's a picture of Christian when he was a lot younger back in those days. And um, we had the TPTP library. So we thought, let's have a competition. And the most important thing is summarized there. We realized from the beginning, the competition should be only 50% about saying who's the winner, who's the loser, who's the best, who's second. But also 50% about providing an environment in which people could interact and talk about fear improving learn from each other and have a lot of fun doing it. And so part of that means we have t-shirts, we have a dinner party, we have gambling, we have a great competition. And you'll be able to watch it online this year if you register for the workshops of the Cade 28 conference. And that's just $20 to register and you can go to every workshop as well. So the first competition was in 1996. Look, there's me when I was young. Wasn't I a happy little chap? That was at Dimax. Channel Tamad, Don Loveland, people might know his book, Jeff Pelshier from Alberta, who was a great supporter. And, um, and now it's an annual event. If you look every year, we have it, and these are all the years we've had it. The critical thing is that it's not just evaluate, oh, well, let's just say the design and rules are online. You can look at it. If you've got a theorem prover, please enter. We'd love to have you. And we have rules, you're not allowed to cheat. We have a panel that checks that nobody's cheating and we have trophies and money and travel prizes. It's totally good. But it's not just evaluation, it's public, but we want to stimulate people and provide an inspiring, inspiring environment. And part of that is to provide great t-shirts. These are all the t-shirt designs, aren't they fantastic? All sorts of t-shirts. Every year we have a different t-shirt and everybody gets a t-shirt and we all wear one and uh, enjoy it. Whoops, it's easy. Here come the rest. There's last year from Brazil. Huh? How's that for a Brazil one? Uh, that was the year before. Here's last year when it was during COVID and everybody was rushing to buy toilet paper. So I made the t-shirt design based on COVID last year. This year's design is fantastic, by the way. All right, so let me say that um let me sum up now because we took 10 minutes to go Let's see what i should work so i know at the beginning raul explained to me that people out there in youtube world may are from different areas of computer science and different areas of artificial intelligence and maybe this overview has got you interested given you some ideas about automated theorem proving what it is what it can be used for and the tools that are freely available in my world for you to use and learn about automated theorem proving. If you want a little bit more, I have a tutorial involved. Oh, I haven't linked. I'll show you. I'll put up a link to the tutorial that will work you through learning different logics from propositional to first order to type first order to type higher order and then with links into my tools so that you can practice using an automated theorem prover to solve real world problems. Well, I give you some toy problems to play with. Um, and these are all there. I'll put a link in over here. And so if somebody said, you've been doing this for 28 years, or well, some years ago, somebody said that. They said, why does this all work? How do you keep such a big project together? And I kind of, I do it myself and I have help from a lot of people. 
So I think here's kind of why this project works, is that there's a core infrastructure based around a common language that is used to express problems, express solutions in a formal way. So it's these components over here I've spoken about. I provide services, online fear improving services, verification, interestingness, a viewer, process language, and also tools to enable you to call fear improvers on my server for free, paid for by the American taxpayer, in order to do so to run your fear improving tasks. You don't have to install anything on your own computer, just use my services and I'm happy to have you use it. TPTP compliance. For the Prologue programmers out there who read the book, The Craft of Prologue by Richard O'Keefe, in the introduction, he says, elegance is not optional. And I say, I don't have a book, so I can't have a link here. Compliance is not optional. I've had a lot of focus on many people have helped me, many developers and many contributions for which I'm grateful. And I always love to hear from people. Email me and I answer email fast. But I think I worked out why it really works. It's a strange effect. What I did is I started collecting photographs of people who use the TPTP and people who don't. So there's me. I use the TPTP. Here's Tim Bray. He doesn't. Christian Suckner, when he worked in the TPTP, then he went to industry. Look what happened. Larry Paulson uses it. Bill McCune doesn't. Ben Fisher, Jörg Siegmund. I hope everyone from the machine learning community at least can pick up the pattern. Top row TPTP users, bottom row not TPTP users, just famous computer science in the AI community, Jörg Siegmund, John Slaney, we see. We know who this one is over here, and we know Doug Lennett from the cycle. And if you watched the talk last month, you saw the talk by Chris Bensmuller, which was kind of strange, because he's in the bottom row. You can see he doesn't have the... Uh, he doesn't have the TPTP haircut, which all the others have to have. But what I realized that now Chris has been converted into a TPTP users, that's what he's going to look like in a couple of weeks. It really is a matter of the haircut. I'm joking. Of course, I enjoy the TPTP. So that's the end of my talk. And I'm happy to take any questions and um, or answer emails at any time. I'll hand it back to you now, Raul. I'm seeing questions in the chat. Raul, do you want me to answer them directly? Uh, no, no I, 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 I will read the questions for you. OK, great. Uh, so thank you very much for the talk, Jeff. That was very stimulating, uh, very interesting, uh, seeing how your child has been growing up all these years. And now I, we have some questions. So the first question is from Enrique, who actually works on probabilistic logic. And his question is about that. What about? Uncertainty, non-monotogic logic or probabilistic logic, do you consider also in TPTP? All right, yeah, that's um, something, the answer, the short answer is not yet. Certainly, automated theorem proving in probabilistic and uncertainties is a difficult task, and I congratulate you for every success that you have in EK. I have just started moving into non-classical logics, which includes logics of uh, the modal logics, the ontic logics, non-monotonic logics, and I'm waiting for my next grant to be awarded. I haven't heard from the NSF yet. And then I will be extending the TPTP into those areas. I have a personal interest in multi-value logics, uh, you know, like FDE, RM3, that style of logic, and I have, I have theorem provers for those. I don't have theorem provers for reasoning over uncertainty and probabilistic. If you own one and you have some problems, Let's have a conversation and maybe we can wedge you into the TPTP in a way that will be useful for other people to get at your work and to make connections. Okay, very good. So uh, one more question about the sledgehammer. So from what you said, um, uh, Isabel calls uh, the uh, TP server and uh, does it call all the theorem provers in the server or just a subset? And what's the time constraint? All right. So all of those are made, the decision is made by the Sledgehammer user. You can configure Isabel to do whatever you want. 
The standard Isabel configuration calls Vampire using a 60 second, I believe, timeout. But all of those can be sent down as parameters to the call into my server. If you want to run many theorem provers and you want a shorter or longer time limit, I don't mind. I don't, it's not going to be bogged down. I haven't ever yet been bogged down. The one thing I do offer, and maybe I could just take a moment to show this, is sometimes you don't know which theorem prover to use. So, for example, you maybe you wanted to solve this problem plus zero zero one plus one, and you don't know which theorem prover to use because you need yeah. Wait, wait, wait a moment. Uh, I think we have to switch oh, the sorry, screen. Yeah. Uh, Marcella, can you switch uh, so that we can see the screen? Oh, thanks, Raul. Okay. Let me yeah, go back. You can see the screen. Yeah. So here I'm just showing it's my interface again, and if you're new to the area and you don't know which theorem prover to use, I have other things here. You can put in a problem. Let's say that one and ask for a recommendation. And it tells you a recommendation, so you can see the most recommended one is Vampire, then Enigma, and then E. It tells you the most recommended pro uh, theorem provers for that problem. And in fact, you don't even have to ask for a recommendation. You can just say, run parallel, and it will take the top three recommended systems and run the top three recommended systems for you in parallel. And eventually, it looks like here, yep, the proof was found by Vampire. So it was good. It used Vampire Sat and it used well, something didn't work. So it'll run recommended systems for you and you don't have to do. But again, you can set the time limit down over here. And again, if you do it programmatically as an Isabel, you can set the time limit and you can essentially click as many buttons as you want. OK, very good. So another question is the following. So in, in the case that uh, you run a system and you expect to get an answer, sometimes you have you can encode everything in a synonymous way. Like, like in Lambda calculus, you can have exactly the same function, but it's encoded in a different way. How do you cope with synonyms? <laughs> Uh, so at my end of the world, I don't do anything. That's a user end story. So when you, if you're a mathematician, say, and you're writing a problem, there are different ways to encode things. Absolutely. And then it's up to you to decide which encoding works. Now, of course, from a theorem proving perspective, different tools do better on different types of encoding. So again, if this is still up, let me show you an example of that. Yeah, Marcella, can you switch on the yep, screen? Switch on my screen, please, yep. So if we go into set theory over here for the mathematicians, and we see here, if we just look across the top, set theory problem number two. There's one, two, three, four, five different encodings of it. The first one is in clause normal form. The next two are in full first order form. And the last one's in higher order form. You can see here, this encoding uses uh, a tasky Grutendick set theory encoding. We look at the next example. This uses, uh, um, this is Dominic Pastier's encoding, which is naive set theory. And let's look at the higher order one. This is in Ben Smuller's encoding of modal logic under S4. Wow, so it comes out to be a set theory problem. The point I'm making is that for each problem, I do support different encodings. they called versions of a problem. And then, if you want, try them all against different theorem provers and find out which one works best for you as a user. But from my end, I don't do anything about it internally. OK. Now, about uh, your competitions. Um... Can we switch back to the to the two to the double screen, Marcella? Okay, thank you. Um, about the competition, so when when in, in any competition, you always have uh, some problems which are known and some problems that uh, the competitors have not seen. Do you also have that mixture in your competitions? Yes, correct. So, in fact, we're very careful to do that because what we did find after about the first ten years 
is that people were looking at the TPTP library and tuning their theorem prover to solve only the problems in the TPTP, but not be general. So what we do now, what I do, is that each year I collect problems and the TPTP grows by about 2,000 problems a year. And I keep those new problems hidden away and I don't release them until after the competition. And then during the competition, there's a random selection of problems, but that random selection is biased to use new problems that ensures that people build their theorem provers to be general, generally applicable rather than only for the theorem prove the problems that are they already know from the TPTP. So yes, we definitely have a bunch of new unseen problems each year. Okay. Now about the future of uh, theorem proving, when are we going to see theorem proving in Alexa? I suspect you already do see theorem proving in Alexa. I don't think Amazon tells you everything that they do. It's not kind of a public company. Certainly, Google have a large theorem proving group um, run by Christian Zaghetti. We know Amazon has a formal methods group, one in England and one in the USA, and they employ people who know about theorem proving. So I, I don't know to what extent those theorem proving tools are in there, but I believe they are there. What I can say maybe more definitively is if those of you who have used IBM's Watson tool, is that there's definitely theorem provers embedded into IBM Watson as a tool. But it's, as I said earlier, often the theorem proving program is one component of a much more complex reasoning environment. And that's why you need standard interfaces, you know, which I've provided, so that they can be embedded easily. There are other tools which are not commercial, as commercially successful as Siri, Alexa, and things like that. For example, log answer, which are more directly embedding, more di use theorem proving more directly. Okay, so we have another question. Uh, I wonder if people have tried using machine learning for theorem proving. Ah, yes, indeed. That's a, a core development in the last three to five years. The use of machine learning to help theorem provers improve their performance. Now, in theorem proving, there are two key things that have to be solved. The simple one that we all know about is during the inference is what inference should I make next? That's the search problem. And indeed, machine learning has been used quite successfully to help theorem provers improve that decision. The key system, the system that's been most successful so far is the Enigma system, which is out of uh, Charles University, uh, not Charles University now, it's the research group of Joseph Urban, AI for Reason. Although everybody's playing this game, the vampire people are playing it, the E people, how do you use machine learning to help choose what inference to do next? The second part where machine learning is useful is when you're reasoning in the real world. When you've got a system where you've got three million axioms, if you give three million axioms to your average theorem prover, they choke, it's too much. And in lots of things, you might have three million axioms, but only eight of them are needed to solve the problem. So using, selecting the correct few axioms before you begin and throwing the others away can improve the performance of a theorem prover quite dramatically. And that work, axiom selection or premise selection, is also uses machine learning. Of course, you take some existing proofs, look which axioms were used in the proof, learn their characteristics with respect to the conjecture that you're trying to prove. And then when you come to a new unseen problem, use that machine learning model in order to help you select which axioms are most likely to be useful for a proof. So it's happening and it really is changing the nature of theorem proving. Really last year in the competition, we saw with the malaria system, which is from Joseph Urban again, the Prague group are on top of this business, that their use of machine learning really can improve performance. If you're interested in the application of machine learning to theorem proving, the invited talk by Marcus Raab at, uh, from Google at K28 this year will look at a survey of how machine learning is being used in automated theorem proving in Google. Okay. What are the dates of uh, the conference? Uh, Cade is uh, July 12 to July 15. 
with workshops on the 11th and 16th. Okay, so... If you just look up cade-28.info, that's um, the website. Okay. Well, we don't have uh, any more questions. So thank you very much, Jeff. It was a great talk. And I think it was also a great uh, inspiration for anybody who wants to, for any student who wants to start going into this field and also for researchers in other fields like machine learning to also look beyond their own field to these developments. So thank you very much again. Uh, thank you for uh, talking today. And um, I hope next time uh, you can come in person to Mexico to give this talk or yeah, another talk. Thanks, <laughs> Raul. And everybody out there, please feel free to email if you've got questions or you'd like links or any details and the link to this talk. Thank you. Bye.